I usually begin remarks by pointing out what you know, that although I sound a little like James Earl Jones, <laughs> I look exactly like Denzel Washington. <laughs> I think we've just debunked the notion that we all look alike. <laughs> <laughs> Madam President Edgar, Mr. Motley, Mr. Dawson, I thank you for your kind and overly generous remarks. I congratulate my fellow honorees. They are distinguished counsel, and I am truly privileged to walk in their company. I am personally particularly pleased to receive this award from the Metropolitan Black Bar Association, the lineal descendant of Bedford-Stuyvesant Legal Services, because I was born in Bed-Stuy, Dean and Nostrin. <laughs> and the Harlem Lawyers Association, because I was raised in the Polo Grounds Projects, Colonial Park Projects, before it changed its name to the Wrangell Projects, right next to the Polo Grounds in Harlem. As lawyers, each of us has a sacred duty to advance the cause of our clients. That client may be a Fortune 100 company on Wall Street. That client may be a homeless parent with children in Manhattan. That client may be a technology startup in Brooklyn. That client may be a storefront operation on Queens Boulevard or Jamaica Avenue. That client may be a government agency on Fordham Road. That client may be a cooperative in the Stapleton Projects of Staten Island. That client may be an indigent defendant on Rikers Island. Whoever that client might be, this great Bar Association continues to guide and inspire its members and you, its supporters, every step of the way. Tonight, by virtue of your being here, by virtue of your contributions, and by virtue of what I know will be very aggressive texting, <laughs> and we have the Chief Judge of the Southern District uh, here today, and. We're not going to talk about the other kind of texting that Chief Judge Preska just took a uh, <laughs> plea in because I'm from the Eastern District of New York and we, we don't do that sort of thing over there. I'm a lifetime member of this organization and I support its traditions. And those traditions have empowered this kid from Bed-Stuy and Harlem to move through the pipeline, to move from the projects of Harlem to the boardrooms of Wall Street, and now to the bench of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York as an Article III judge. In 1972, when I was a... In 1972, when I was a first-year law student, um, just to give you an idea of what it really means to have sacrifice in one's family, Supreme Court Justice Tom Clark stepped down from the Supreme Court because his son, Ramsey Clark, was becoming Attorney General. And Justice Clark came to our law school, and he was asked, what's the biggest mistake that a lawyer makes in arguing a Supreme Court case? And he said, the biggest mistake that lawyers made was the following. He would ask the lawyer a question, and the lawyer would say, I don't know the answer, Your Honor, because I didn't try the case in the lower court. And if you ever heard Justice Clark speak, he had a voice that made me sound like a soprano. <laughs> and he said in this deep Texas drawl, counsel, never refer to the trial court as the lower court. The trial court is where 95% of our citizens receive 100% of American justice. 
the trial court is the true Supreme Court of these United States. Justice Sheila Abdus Salam understood this reality. Her powerful analytical abilities combined with her graceful and elegant intellectual rigor to command respect and attention across the political and legal landscape. Her sudden passing, like the sudden passing of another legendary High Court Justice from New York, Justice Scalia, shocked and saddened the judiciary throughout this great country. However, it did something much more important. It made every judge on every court more determined to embrace the rule of law. As lawyers, as trial judges, and as appellate justices, those two justices embodied the best of the law. They fashioned those wise restraints that make us free without fear, without favor. I accept this award tonight with a grateful but a heavy heart. I accept this award with thanks to my beautiful bride, Dr. Alice Beale, with whom with whom, if I'm lucky and she doesn't kick me to the curb between now and midnight, we will celebrate our 39th wedding anniversary. So if I duck out of the after party a little bit early, you can assume it's just because I'm an old guy. <laughs> And Dr. Beale will probably tell you that's right. That's just because I'm an old guy. I thank her and I thank God for our three beautiful children, Will, Kate, and Lizzie. I recall the memory of my parents, William Francis Coons the first of Harlem and Margaret Evelyn Brown of Roseryville, Maryland, and because I know they're with us tonight. But above all, I accept this award with one caveat, that we now and forever acknowledge publicly what we all know in our hearts. Tonight you kindly call me the jurist of the year, but we all know the true jurist of this year was Justice Sheila Abdus Salam. She treated me with grace and respect from the moment we met many years ago. I had been a judge for all of 10 minutes, and she treated me as if I'd been a judicial colleague for two decades. She left us far too soon. I have a view that tonight in heaven, Justice Salam and Justice Scalia are debating points of law together <laughs> as they stand before the one jurist for all years. Admittedly, one of those judges is to his left and one of those judges <laughs> is to his right. But let the record reflect, I'm not saying which is which. <laughs> they are arguing with wit and grace. The one jurist that they are arguing before is the one who presides over all courts, the one who rules in every age, the one who will call each of us by name to welcome us to our eternal reward. He is the one trial judge who reigns supreme not tonight but every night, not this year but every year. He is the one trial judge who is never reversed. Tonight, to borrow a line from Shakespeare, you dress me in borrowed robes, 
robes borrowed from those great jurists have gone ahead, but you do something more. You bless me in those borrowed robes. And for that blessing, this son of Bed-Stuy and this son of Harlem is truly grateful. God bless you, God bless your families, and God bless the United States of America. Good evening. Judge Coons is a very, very, very hard act to follow, and I'm not even going to try. First, I would like to thank the Metropolitan Black Bar. I am truly humbled to receive this honor from such a distinguished organization, an organization that has and continues to strive for greater equity and diversity within the legal profession. A very special thank you to President Paula Edgar, the officers and the board of directors for this recognition and continuing to host such a fantastic gala, 33 years and counting. And I would also like to extend congratulations to the on other honorees. When I was informed uh, that I would be receiving this honor and providing remarks tonight, I kept on returning to the concept of the afterthought. Recently, I, had I attended a dinner where Jeremy Travis, the former president of John Jay College of Criminal Justice, gave a speech in which he both recognized and thanked his wife, his daughter and her husband, and his other daughter and her girlfriend. There was consistent applause for each recognition. And in that moment, I was surprisingly conflicted. On one hand, I was pleased to see diversity and sexual orientation truly accepted. Such normalization of difference is something that we progressives seek to achieve. On the other hand, I, I realized that I was subconsciously expecting a different and a more expressive, if not negative, reaction from the audience. And I was surprised when it didn't materialize. The scene I witnessed that night was a manifestation of the afterthought, a moment where a subject had become so ingrained in our collective subconscious that it no longer triggered active or exceptional thought. It was just normal. Achieving this sort of afterthought and by the way, one that does not impede our ability to celebrate individual differences, has been the, the goal of my professional work. I believe that true equality is only realized when we find common ground in being different. And when no demographic is routinely or disproportionately burdened with discrimination or indifference, it's clear to me that we have not reached that level of equality by any objective standard. Our Constitution provides that no state shall abridge the privileges and immunities of citizens, deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law, or deny any person within his jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. But our history is littered with examples of utter disregard for such principles. People in power have justified slavery, justified segregation, and justified the systemic targeting of groups for exclusion from some of this nation's most fundamental institutions and essential benefits of citizenship. The concept of individual liberties has not been objectively defined or protected over time. Rather, we have seen an equal application in theory and in motion for years. With each strike at an exclusion, we have seen dramatic and blatant attempts to use equal protection and equal application concept to perpetuate the status quo in other spheres. I'm not denying you the right to marry. You can marry the person of the same race. I'm not denying you access to this school. You have the same resources in your school district. I'm not barring your admission into this country based on your religion. I'm targeting terrorists. And yet, even while facing evolving challenges and shifting rhetoric, we have made incremental progress. In New York, for example, we have raised the age of criminal responsibility.
We have removed barriers to marriage based on sexual orientation. We've created a special prosecutor to investigate claims involving the death of unarmed civilians at the hands of police. We have created and sustained a robust minority and women-owned business program. And the list goes on. But there is a simp but, there's, but, but there's simply much more work to do. And as trite as this may sound, we can only achieve success in this work if we do it together. Our federal reality, the new reality that we're all waking up every day to realize, means that we cannot succumb to the often prevalent factionalism that limits our ability and our empathy for those that are different from us. We cannot stay in our respective lanes. James Baldwin said in the 1960s that the, that the political vocabulary of this age cannot serve this age. I respectfully submit to you today that we need to revisit our vocabulary. The way we classify ourselves and classify our differences with others if we are to achieve any long-standing success. If we do this, if we honestly accept the challenge of creating holistic and inclusive change, we will ensure that the injustices of today are the afterthoughts of tomorrow. If we do not, we will continue to question those who hold the keys to power as they question why we are in the room in the first place. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. This is home for me, so thank you very, very much. I'm going to start with something that my father-in-law tells me all the time. He says, luck equals opportunity and preparedness. And I have been one very lucky person. And I've been very fortunate to have the Metropolitan Black Bar in my life. I want to thank the president, Paula Edgar, for all of her hard work this year and the things she's doing for our organization. She's not doing it alone, so I thank the board, the officers, and the volunteers for your work. Thank the Most High, Jehovah, for all he's done for me and his son, Christ Jesus. I thank my beautiful wife, the lovely Stacy St. Rose, she's not here tonight because her godson is graduating from high school. So I, her and my daughter are down in Maryland. But she's my inspiration, she's my fuel, a game changer. When I got serious about her, I got serious about my career. I'd like to thank Margot Ferrandino for being a great friend, a great mentee, and for nominating me for this award. I, I want to take a step back and thank the Honorable Priscilla Hall, the Honorable Judge Cheryl Gonzalez, the Honorable Alvin Yearwood, and the presidents that came before me particularly Nadine Johnson, the Honorable Dakota Ramsher, and Xavier Donaldson. And, 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 and why do I say this? Um, because the MBBA is very near and dear to my heart. And I recall being a member of the city bar um, and uh, Judge Gonzalez uh, tapping on my shoulder at a gala like this and say, I think it's time for you to join the MBBA board. And that's how this all got started, because Judge Gonzalez tapped me on the shoulder and said, join the board. And then her and Nadine Johnson conspired <laughs> to put me in the leadership pipeline of this great organization. So thank you for that. I share this award with you. I grew up in the MBBA, and I want to tell you this. I became a life member first before I ever got any reward from the MBBA of any kind. And so, I, and I don't mean this, this kind of award, 
but I mean any of the fruits that the organization had to bear for me, thankfully. And so I'm encouraging all of you to become life members of the NBA. You're going to die black. The organization is black. And so get going. Come on, get down with it. So this is the Private Practitioner of the Year Award. And so I really want to thank, and this is the, you know, the, the theme is so appropriate, building the legal diversity pipeline. And so let me tell you a little bit about how I got built to receive this award. Y'all know I'm emotional, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> But Sheila Boston, and you, you, Dean Garfield, Colton Banks, Sean Mason, the show Bussy, Tamara Stephan. You may know some of these people, you may not. They were all associates at Case Choke. I'm a little boy from Baltimore. And they poured what they had in me. And it was the only way I made it to a mid-level associate is by them pouring in me as a first year. And I used everything they gave me uh, to kind of learn the law and to learn how to survive in a world, in a big law firm world, that really wasn't ready for the African-American, frankly. Um, I want to thank uh, my good friend Joe Hansen, who you probably don't know, some of you may know, for uh, seeing me as a whole person and invested in me at Case Scholler. Uh, you saw Richard Harris, Warden Bellamy, David Critchlow is out here, Sharon Bowen, uh, a gentleman, Herb Revolt, you probably don't know, for taking the time and, and helping me understand the business of law and how to succeed and how to be on the path to partnership, uh, mentoring outside of the law firm. So when we talk about building a pipeline, these are the things we need you to do to help young people grow into mature lawyers, uh, successful and happy at what they do. I want to thank my law firm, Cooley LLP, uh, Table 13, right here. Uh, because the interesting, then there's a tie to this. And so when I interviewed at Cooley LLP, I was counsel at Case Scholler. And I was ready to become a law firm partner. So when I was interviewing with Cooley LLP, they said, well, there are three factors, because we don't really bring in counsel and make them partner. But one of the factors was the leadership that I had here in the Metropolitan Black Bar Associated. So I had the trial experience, I had the pedigree, and I had the leadership experience. And they said, well, if you have all three of those, you're ready for, to come in and be a partner with us without question. And they were the only firm that actually credited the leadership. And so I have to thank them for seeing that in me and bringing me into their partnership. Thank you. Now, I would be remiss. This is the Private Practitioner of the Year Award. And sometimes when I see awards, I'm like, well, why is he or her getting that award? I do that occasionally. <laughs> and so. I was a little nervous because I said, well, why am I getting this award? Well, in part, I have had the best year I've ever had, and we're in May at the law firm. So, you know, I, I would like to thank the uh, Googles of the world, <laughs> the Motorola's of the world, the Microsoft's of the world, the Pier Ones of the world, the Chases of the world, the Axe Equals of the world, the Rocket to Marketings of the world, the TMP Worldwide of the world, the Estee Lauders of the world, you know, all of those people who have invested in me. No question. And, you know, to be, to be frank, I'm a first generation uh, college student, a first generation lawyer. Uh, my mom was a secretary. She retired in management at her, at her firm. 
My dad was a 30-year-old steel worker. He worked from 18 to 48. He retired after 30 years. I come from the public schools. Uh, uh, and so I am a, this a product of what education can get you. And so between education, hard work, accountability, and responsibility. So, you know, with that, and, and, and Judge uh, Koontz, I think he was over here, but he, he was over here. You took a lot of pressure off of me. I saw that text to pledge. So I want to say thank you because education is vital. And everyone, please contribute something. There's something you can contribute to the scholarship fund. So please do so. I'm going to contribute $1,000 of my own money. And I encourage all of my peers to at least match or exceed me. And so Stacey hates when I do this. So I'm glad she's not here. But anyway, she doesn't hate when I give, but just spontaneously give. Uh, um, the other thing I'll say, because I really want to drive this point home, the things you do in your life, and you really don't know when you unselfishly invest in the pipeline, what it can do for you. And it can be unimaginable results. So I like to try cases. I don't get to try that many, but when I try them, they're pretty big cases. And so where did I get my skill sets from? Well, I did mock trial. Not mock trial on my own as a, as a, as a student. I coached mock trial. And what does a big law firm litigator know about trying cases? Pretty much nothing as a mid-level associate. <laughs> so I brought in trial attorneys to help me teach the kids. In turn, they taught me how to try cases. <laughs> so by me giving back to the pipeline, it got me this award here today. <laughs> so I would say give back to the, the pipeline. And so I invested in diversity. Some say I'm a champion of diversity, but the reality is diversity has helped me out tremendously. So my largest client opportunity came from me building a relationship at a diversity event and having a Delta introduce me to my own frat brother who introduced me to four people that got me to my single largest client. And so if I wasn't out and about, if I wasn't at that event, I probably wouldn't be standing here today. Uh, okay, because you have to achieve a little bit to be recognized in this way. And, and so what I say to you is, if you invest in the pipeline, you'll have unimagin unimaginable results. So I would say we cherish our success, but we learn from our failure. If you do not take the reins of your careers, you will not have meaningful successes or failures. I challenge you to take risks and be rewarded with unimaginable opportunity. Thank you very much for this award. I appreciate and love the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. Thank you. Smalls. <laughs> Word. Don't get it twisted. Wall Street loves some biggie biggie. <laughs> baby, baby. It was all a dream. Birthdays were the worst days. Now we sip champagne when we're... I can't rap all night, right? I gotta give like an official speech or something. <laughs> I'm so glad that you all are here tonight. I'm honored and surprised um, when I uh, first found out. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that story. Um, <clears throat> but at first I wanna thank President Paula Edgar. Where did she go? Did she go back to her seat? She's quick. Um, thank you, President Paula Edgar. Thank you to the MBBA board and thank you to the MBBA staff for putting together a wonderful celebration tonight. We have a lot to celebrate. We have challenges that we seek to overcome time and time again, but it is imperative and important that we find these opportunities to celebrate us. If you all will indulge me, I'm gonna tell you a little story. Um, after I got the call from Paula, President Paula, um, inviting me to um, accept this prestigious honor, I was very honored, I was excited, told a couple friends, told my wife. I went home that night, I woke up the next morning, and I was a little more ambivalent. So I, I went to my desk, I composed an email, and I sent a note to four people, four of my board of director members, um, sharing my thoughts and asking for their counsel and their advice. Um, 
I actually have the email here, the printout from the email, and uh, I actually want to read this to you all. I want to read their responses. First <clears throat> was Jim Breedlove. He's a mentor and a friend. He's a, a fellow Davis Polk alumnus. He's a retired general counsel from Praxair, a Fortune 500 company. He currently sits on a public company board, and he won, he received this award several years before me. He was going to be with us tonight, but um, something came up. Those of you that know Jim, not only is he a smooth brother, not only is he one of the smartest brothers that you may ever meet, but he's quite analytical, and it was in his response. He said, Nate, it's commendable that you have a great sense of humility despite A, your significant professional accomplishments, B, the mentoring of younger black folk within and outside of Morgan Stanley, and C, the huge amount of work and dedication you devoted to bringing young brothers together to advance fellowship for the in the trenches experience sharing and for career enhancement. But my take is that the extensive work you've done in the B and C areas alone qualify you for a Trailblazer Award. You know, I have to go back and read it like two or three times, make sure I understood all the points he was making. He said, remember that there's no hard and fast standard of how far one needs to be in their career to qualify for that award. Many past MBBA Trailblazer awardees, for example, may have been older than you or have advanced further in their careers, but not made nearly the same impact on other young black folks' lives as you've made. So net net, I see no reason why you should hesitate to graciously accept this distinguished award. It's well deserved. Second, Carla Harris, Vice Chairman of Morgan Stanley, Senior, senior Client Advisor, one of the baddest investment bankers on Wall Street. I've had the privilege of having her as a mentor and sponsor to me for a number of years. Also a very energizing woman. Her email response read as follows. First of all, congratulations, all caps, exclamation point, exclamation point. <laughs> Second, you should do it for all the reasons you cited and because you don't know who will be inspired, motivated, and will believe in themselves because they hear your story. Oftentimes, when we are nominated to these lists divinely, it is not about us at all, but for someone else. Lastly, you deserve it and you should accept that someone else has recognized it. Remember, somebody else didn't get the call. Third, <clears throat> one of the best executive search professionals, the newly minted Major Lindsay and Africa partners, Sonia Sohm. Sonia, where are you? Holla, holla so I can see you, over there. Sonia has become my personal coach. Um, personal and professional coach. She shares a lot of insights and helps me navigate my career. Um, do it. You deserve it. Remember, the more accolades you have, the more prestige and attention that you can bring to your efforts on behalf of the community and for your own career. And to inspire others, including Sweet Baby Pie, which is my daughter. <laughs> Finally, my brother from another mother, the brother who gave me the succinct yet sage advice how to successfully transition to in-house practice. That is, not to be the BPU, the business prevention unit, and also the first black managing director in the history of Morgan Stanley's legal and compliance division, Dwayne Hughes. <laughs> Dwayne, please stand. My man. in his traditional style of being very uh, succinct and sage and dispositive, his response email said, you should accept, period, I will not discuss this further. <laughs> I wanted to share that experience with you all because that's my cohort. Those are the people that I've been privileged to have into my life who have made the decision that they're gonna take their hard-earned insights and experiences and share them with me. That they're gonna give me the privilege and the honor of learning from them so that I may do a little bit better. So when I think about the theme tonight, when we're talking about the legal diversity pipeline, I am the pipeline, right? It's an improbable journey that this young boy from Brooklyn, this first-generation American, the son of Haitian descendants, Haiti Sheri, Sak Passe, would be standing here before you with the successes that I have achieved. Indeed, it's hard work, 
and sacrifice on my part. Our family has felt a toll, but this wouldn't happen without many of you. So I'm going to briefly try to thank a number of people that have been deeply influential. I will not be able to thank you all because I may not have enough time before Paula drags me off the stage. Um, but I'm going to thank a few. Those of you that I do not thank, you know who you are, you know what you mean to me, so thank you. First and foremost, God. Because only God knows the journey that has been laid out for me, but every single day I am thankful for the step I take um, in his name, amen. I wanna thank my family, especially my wonderful mother who's here tonight. Mom, please stand. <laughs> Nicole St. Victor. The life lessons that I've gotten from this woman are innumerable, invaluable, and immeasurable. But it's really the precious, the precious love that you can only have from a mother that has driven me for so many years. And many times I ask my mom, how do I pay it back? How much does it cost? And every single time she has only one answer for me. What is it, mom? No charge. <laughs> Shirley Caesar. To my beautiful wife, Dr. Christina Altavis Twyman St. Victor, please stand. She's not gonna stand. She's waving, but she's not gonna stand. But she's right here for me. She was foolish enough to say I do. I'm an opportunist, so I took it and ran with it. <laughs> but, Tina, you inspire me. You enrich me. And most importantly, the love and the nourishment that you give to our beautiful baby girl I have no words for it. <laughs> to my two-year-old baby girl, Regina Claire St. Victor. We didn't bring her tonight. There was a debate. Tina won. <laughs> As you can tell by the biggie dance, I'm the more reckless of the two. <laughs> she is strong. She is confident. She is smart and she is kind. <laughs> That's our morning ritual. Every day I do that with her. And some of you may not know, but I don't live in New York City any longer. I commute to New York for work. Um, and so I have days where I'm here, nights where I'm here, and I don't see her every day. But I always feel her presence. I feel her presence right now on this stage with me because she is my everything. She is the driving force now for everything that I do. And it's a blessing. All right, who else we got? To my Duke crew and my Georgetown crew, stand up. Duke, Georgetown. In the house. Especially Janine Conley. I'm sorry, Miss Chair of the New York Urban League Board of Directors, Janine Conley. When I graduated, when we were graduating law school, we're law school classmates. And we're, when we were graduating law school, I was the president of the Black Law Student Association. They offered me the opportunity to address um, our, uh, our, our peer, our cohort, um, and I offered some thoughts. I said it was imperative that we make a commitment to our community that is longstanding, regardless of what we chose as our legal pursuits. Even if we went to the Wall Street firm's big law as overly paid junior associates, we had to find a way. Janine, your commitment has exceeded even the stretch of my imagination, and I'm thankful for it, and we are all thankful for it. <laughs> to my Davis Polk family and alum, where's the Davis Polk table? I cut my teeth at Davis Polk. They gave me a best-in-class training as a securities attorney, uh, which has carried with me 
for the 15 years that I've been practicing law. I am thankful for them for that, and I continue to benefit. They are one of my outside counsel. <laughs> so I am very thankful for Davis Polk. There are several law firms in this room that um, support me in my business that, uh, that do my work. Uh, I just want to name three. Sidley Austin, where's Sidley? Patrick Michelle? Thank you, Sidley. Strook? Is Strook in the house? And a newer firm that we've been working with more recently, which is the largest African-American-owned corporate law firm, Brian and Rubino. Where's Seth Bryant and his firm? <laughs> to my Morgan Stanley family. What's up, fam? <laughs> 11 years at the same shop. Uh, you saw the words from my chief legal officer. You saw words from Dwayne. Uh, my general counsel, Ann Cooney, is here. Cassandra Knight, Shamina Sneed, Alita Wingfield, Mike Henry, Mia Burgess, Audrey Adams. We've got a bad team on Wall Street doing crazy crazy things. We have firefighters, we've got architects, we got problem solvers, we got soldiers. We've worked on a lot of interesting matters. Um, and it's just been quite a journey. I never thought that the practice of law could be so exciting and so strong. And I'm so thankful that I've been on this journey with you all. Thank you. To the chief diversity officers that are here, so many of you are the first responders. You're the line of defense. You're the innovations, the innovators that are coming up with the best strategies for us to try to achieve equality and level the playing field so that diverse talent can have a fair shake at success so that we can be in the boardrooms. So I applaud all of the chief diversity officers from the stalwarts like the Anna Browns and the Maya Hazels, and the Malik Jones, and the Carlos Davia Caballeros. I can't ever pronounce his name, but I love that brother. Where's Cleary? And then there's the, the new generation, right, of diverse talent. You talk about pipeline. DeAndre, DeAndre Carr is here tonight. Watch out for DeAndre. I want to briefly mention a few legends. Most of them are not here tonight but I have to say their name. Macy Russell, who actually is here tonight. Thank you, Macy, for coming in from Boston. Wharton Bellamy, Ben Wilson, Bill Snipes, Rhonda Joy McLean, Sheila Boston, Chris Reynolds, Dick Parsons, Vernon Jordan. Some brief, some long-term. I have had the benefit of insights from the, these individuals. They have told me to be the person that others want to succeed. They have taken their insights and given me that as valuable currency to develop excellence. And I am thankful for them. To the trade associations and the nonprofits who allow me to execute on my core value of giving back, I'm thankful for them. The Council of Urban Professionals. Do we have Cup Fellows in the house? Christina Grant is here, I see her. 2009 Cup Fellow, we've been riding hard ever since. She changed her flight to come to this. She was supposed to be in, I think this is the third state that she has been in today. Uh, but thank you for coming here to support us. Legal Outreach, my favorite not-for-profit. I've got a love story with Legal Outreach. Um, Bill McGovern, who was um, at Morgan Stanley, gave me an opportunity to, to lead our internship program years ago. And I uh, worked with Dwayne Hughes on that. I worked with Mike Henry on that um, and got to meet these amazing, talented young kids. And you talk about pipeline, they're hungry. They're, they're smart, but they're just hungry for the opportunity. So we do moot court mock trial. We've trained them to become the best. Um, we did, um, years ago, the executive director, James O'Neill, came to us 
and he wanted uh, some seed capital to start a program for black and Hispanic boys, eighth grade boys, to go into the high school pipeline program. We helped raise the capital to get that started. And then last year, the program had grown so much, we did a fundraiser, I co-chaired it, we raised half a million dollars for those boys. And what was moving for me was that 100,000 of that, those dollars came from African-American men. To Namwolf, to SIFMA, and to the New York City Bar Association. Brett, I don't know where Brett is. Hey, Brett. Executive Director of the New York City Bar, Gabrielle Brown, is down here. Justice Richter, my co-chair on the Enhanced Diversity in the Profession Committee. I'm stepping off that committee next week, um, but I look forward to my new role as, the, uh, as a member of the New York City Bar's Executive Committee. Thank you, Brett, for that opportunity. Now, where are my brothers? Where's the group? Stand up. Members of the group, stand up, please. Where are my 1844 brothers? Stand up. Where are my Aaron's Beard brothers? Where's ISI? Where are the My Brothers Keeper brothers? And where are the members of my Charting Your Own Course family? Stand up. They say it takes a village. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen without them. We have had powerful shared experiences with one another, helping each other redefine the meaning of fellowship so that we can support one another. And because of all those people that were just standing, I am a better attorney and probably a better father and husband. Toy Wigley is here. Uh, I met her back in 2002 when I came back to New York. I left Brooklyn when I was young and I promised I'd come back to New York. I came back in 2002 to Harlem. I wasn't ready. I didn't know. I went down south. I didn't know. Um, Toy was a trusted advisor. She helped me navigate these streets. And I'm always thankful for her friendship. I know, Paul, I'm going to wrap it up. <laughs> to the mentors, I already named a few. You saw Dwayne on the screen. I want to name and single out one other mentor. This brother here was a former Morgan Stanley colleague. He's now a general counsel of financial services firm and he is forever going to be my friend. Kevin Armstrong, my brother. Kevin, Kevin was the one, they say I'm like the mayor of New York because of these relationships. Kevin was the one who pulled me aside. I was, in, I was like in the books all the time. I'm like, as long as I have the best work product, everybody will think I'm the best. I don't need to do anything. I don't need relationships. And Kevin was the one who told me, you need to develop relationships, Nate. It is imperative, if you want to succeed as an attorney, that you develop relationships for your career, for your professional development, and to leverage those relationships to achieve your goals. And I'm thankful to Kevin for that. Between you, between you and Dwayne Hughes, the two of you are the primary architects to my success, and I hope that you're happy with your work product. So look around, that's my village, right? When a team looks like that, how do you lose? Finally, the last one. Y'all thankful I'm almost done, right? For those of you that have given me the greatest privilege next to being a father and a husband, for those of you that have allowed me to be your ment mentor, please stand. If I have given you advice during the course of your career, please stand. Because I'm going to let everybody in on a little secret. You have given me more than I have given you and that I can ever give you. You have given me hope. And as President Barack Obama said in 2008 during his um, primary speech, New Hampshire, he said, in the unlikely story of America, there has never been anything false about hope. I thank you all for this wonderful award.
It was all a dream. I don't know what I would have done without that grouping. Thank you so, so much. And now, remember during the break, I said I was gonna come back and talk to you about your phones? They're not dead yet, are they? Because I need your texts. Where are we? I need a number on a text to pledge. What's our status? Oh, look at y'all. Where are we? I need some more text. Let me just say this to you. First of all, I want to thank Sandra Bookman for being fabulous. Oprah Winfrey says you wear a red dress when you want to be seen in the room, and girl, you better wear that red dress. Okay, back to my focus. Um, I want to say to you this. All of us have been law students at some point, most of us in this room. Many of you did not pay to come here today. And yet you had filet mignon, did you not? Let's just talk about the economics of it all. If you're going to have drinks and a meal in New York City on a Friday night, I'm just going to be cheap here and just throw out $75 as a thing, right? That's probably cheap, like not a fancy restaurant. All I'm asking each of you for is $25. If you haven't already given yet, I'm asking you for $25. Please text $25. Your $25 can make the next judge, the next district attorney, the next defense attorney, the next legal aid attorney, we need your money to do the work. And I know it's uncomfortable. You don't want me standing here asking you for money. I actually like it, though. Um, so <laughs> what I'm going to say to you is we have to keep going on, but I'm encouraging you to please give. I know this has been a long time, and I know the DJ is ready for us to party, and I am ready to party, too, but I have some work to do. We have had... Let's close this. We have had a tough year as black lawyers. Um, I didn't think that at the black prom, which is what I call this, we would have to, to have a moment such as this where we talk about the loss that we've had in our community. We have lost a trailblazer. We have lost one of Brooklyn's finest. We have lost the late and great Ken Thompson, District Attorney of Kings County. And um, not only was he the District Attorney, he was also my neighbor. We lived in the next block. Um, I want you to look at his impact. If you would run the video, please.
it was important for us to recognize that we have lost a trailblazer and here to accept the award acknowledging the work of her late husband is Lushan Bembo Thompson here tonight. If a photographer would just come to the front of the room, please. I apologize for the delay. Where, what's happening here? Okay, here we go. Thank you. So. We had a, another loss, a more recent loss, and Judge Koontz alluded to the loss of Justice Sheila Abdul Salam in his remarks. And when you talk about leadership and what that requires, uh, I knew that we had to take on the charge of having a memorial to honor the life and the legacy of Justice Abdul Salam. And so we had the opportunity to partner with over 20 other bar associations to honor her life. But I think it was imperative for us to also understand how much we have lost. We've lost a member, we've lost a trailblazer. And I'd like to take a moment of silence. If you all would just stand to remember Justice Abdul Salam and the impact that she had in our community. Thank you so much. Um, I want to tell you that there will be a memorial, a uh, private memorial, a public memorial for her from her family on the 26th of May. Uh, it's just the Friday. I think that that's the right date. I apologize if that's the wrong date. It's Friday. It's on our website. It's going to be at a church. Is it the 6th? Is that somebody just? 26, thank you. Um, the information is on our website. Uh, there will also be another memorial that will be happening. We will continue to give you information um, about the honoring of her life. She was, any time you walked into a room and she was in the room, you knew that she heard you. And, and come on, you know, judges are fancy, right? So sometimes you kind of talk to a judge and you're like, did they know that I was just talking to them? You always knew that she heard you. And I feel her loss tremendously. And I know that we all do. And so thank you for indulging us. She is, she is so missed. I'm going to move on because this is one of my favorite parts of this show, which is the member of the year, because the person doesn't know who it is. Um, this person, whenever I send an email and say, I need to find out about X, Y, Z thing, and do we do this? Or can you write this letter about this judge? Because they asked us to write a letter, and I don't know. She always answers the call. And when it comes to leadership, answering the call is very important. Our member of the year is the chair of not one, but two committees of this wonderful Metropolitan Black Bar Association. Her name is Asha Smith, and she doesn't know she's getting this award. <laughs> <laughs> you have to come up here to get it, so come on. Congratulations. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I told you, they told me I have, we're over. Okay. Um, we have two members of the year this year. The person who was supposed to receive it, I don't know if she has arrived yet, um, if she is in the room. Let me just tell you about her quickly. I've known this person since she was a law student, and she's been a hustler from the whole time. And all of you who know me know I love a hustle. 
Um, she, she will say, you know what, I know that place is overbooked, but I will volunteer so I can get in there. And she does it with such grace and pride, and I know that it'll take care of whenever she's in the room. I hope that she's here, but if she's not, we're going to take this award and give it to her later. Uh, Desiree Alexander, are you in the room? Are you here? Okay, well, somebody tweet her. <laughs> she got this award, and we move on. Okay. If you would put up my slides, please. I'm going to close this bad boy out right now. You ready? So, when I became the president of the Metropolitan Black Bar, where's my slides? Thank you. <laughs> when I became the president of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association, I did not know we were going to have the president that we have right now. I'm just going to throw it out there. I didn't. <laughs> um, somebody should have told me. Anyway, <laughs> um, they say to whom much is given, much is required. I have been given so, 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 so much. So many of you in this room have poured into me, but I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. I just wanted to let you know that I didn't know that the president was gonna be who it was gonna be now, so that you can understand what I'm talking about when I talk about this. Okay, so when we started out the year, I was like, I like P, because my name is Paula, and P's will work, it's alliteration, it's great. So I had four things. Pipeline, partnership, professional development, and presence. And what do those things mean? These are the things that I thought that the board and the, the, the bar and our community needed in order for us to kind of have a focus. Let's talk about that. The first thing we did was a backpack giveaway. A backpack giveaway to elementary students in each of the five boroughs. Why, you say? Because what does this have to do with the law? Let me tell you why. Because children need to see who they can be. And they don't need to see black lawyers when they are in court. They need to see black lawyers when they're getting free backpacks filled with stuff. And so we went to each borough. Yes, Staten Island too. Shout out. We went to every borough and we gave out 100 backpacks filled with stuff. And what I'm going to tell you is the looks on these kids' faces. You'll see down the hallway all of their pictures with the text of pledge number on it. Um, they understood, their parents understood that this was a little bit different. Our t-shirts say black lawyers matter. Because we do. Because we do. Quick update. This is going to be the second year we're going to do this. I have spoken to Justice Sheila Abdul Salam's family, and they have graciously said it's okay for us to name our backpack giveaway after her. And so, when I say to you, please give, I mean it, because this is going to fund these backpacks. And we're not going to give 100 this year, we're going to give 500 in each borough this year. So not only did we give backpacks, but we gave money, y'all, money. So you saw the students that got the scholarships. We also gave out LSAT prep scholarships. Why, Paula? Because the pipeline is blocked every time you ask somebody to pay for something. So bar prep, LSAT prep, students need these things in order to get the scores that will get them the scholarships and get them into the schools that will enable them to be the people that we know that they can be. So we gave them money. I need your text, please. I need your text, please. All right, let's keep going. Then I was like, ooh, 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 partnership. So not just partnership, meaning it's like a double entendre, right? Because we want black folks to be partners at law firms, do we not? Yes, you heard what Joe said. So we have an initiative called the Partner Pipeline in which we bring together partners at law firms and the folks who can give them business. We had over 25 GCs in a room just to meet black partners, just to have the opportunity to connect and have potential opportunity for business, right? This is important stuff, but then it's not just partnership in that way, it's also partnership with organizations that can change our community. URI, where you at? So, you know I couldn't get on the stage without acknowledging the work of past President Taya Grace. She brought URI into our world. URI is an organization 
that helps the victims of domestic violence and their pets. And their pets. Oh, exactly, because think about your life and how important your pets are to you. And when you have a situation in which your life is torn apart and you have to leave your pet, that makes it even more torn apart. And they do the beautiful, wonderful work of making sure that families stay whole with their pets. And so we thank you and honor you for the work that you do and we will continue to partner with you. <laughs> this year we also partnered with 100 Suits for 100 Men. So many of you gave your suits. Ke Kevin, are you here? He was supposed to be here. Uh, Kevin Livingston is the brother who runs this organization in which suits are given to uh, folks who have just gotten out of prison to enable them to go and do job interviews and come back into our society. We will continue to work with them as well. And then Legal Outreach, y'all all know about Legal Outreach. James O'Neill, where you at? <laughs> The pipeline is important. I'm not gonna be able to say it anymore. It's pipeline is important. Backpack to the boardroom. We gotta start with those backpacks. Next, professional development. So a lot of you work at law firms where you get this for free, but not everybody who works and who is a member of the bar is at a law firm. And even the folks who are deserve to have our bar association edify them in ways that they need to be edified. And so we have done CLEs, we have done other things, and we have also started to do webinars to make sure you don't have to come out, you can sit at your office and learn the things. Sonia, Th Sonia, thank you so much for doing one of our webinars where we had over 100 attendees, thank you. Um, and then, anybody who knows me knows I love a selfie. And I love a hashtag, presence is the last P. We have hashtags, MBBA learns, MBBA Greece, where you get to meet our board members and our leadership. I'm a solution where we do the work of impact in our community. Shout out to my president-elect Jason Clark for the work that he has done to show us that we can all be a solution, not just on police violence towards our community, but also we are going to step into the world of immigration. Because we need to. MBBA NYC, that's our hashtag, please use it. MBBA gives. At Thanksgiving, we had over 100 people show up to volunteer on Thanksgiving Day, to volunteer, because we give, because we're supposed to give back. I told you before, I'm gonna tell you again, black lawyers matter. We do, there's not enough of us, but we're working to change that. The final P is party. So you all know that we have had a photo booth, we got one outside, and we have had a DJ everywhere. We're about to get to a real quick hold, please. Let me tell you what's gonna happen next year. Innovation, we are gonna do new and different things. Mentoring, because I told you, we gotta put into the pipeline. Partnership will continue to do the work. Advocacy, it's time for us to get into the place of making sure that the laws reflect what we need them to reflect, and we are the lawyers that are gonna do that work and community, and training, which stands for impact. We're gonna have impact. Now, I could not get up on the stage without asking you a favor, not just for the text, because I've already asked you that, and I, I hope the texts are coming through. This is what I need, I'm gonna say this to you. I did a check to see how many people in this room are members of my organization. I did a check to see how many members in this room are members of the MBBA. Anybody want to guess? 30? 30%? No, 30. There's 580 people in this room. All I need for you to do is invest in this organization so that we can have impact. Please. 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 Now, okay, I told you before, to, much, to whom much is given, much is required. Leadership is a full body experience. What is happening? Somebody's touching this. Okay, hold please. I am telling you this, I give my whole body to the MBBA. My whole body, right? In the middle of the night, you will see me sending emails on behalf of the MBBA. And the only reason I can do this is two things. Number one, I just need a little, two minutes, please. The one is I was mentored and I was mothered. What happened to my screen, people? 
I was mentored and I was mothered by a woman named Joan Donna Griffith. She was killed on September 11, 2001. Everything that I do is in her legacy. Everything. But these good looks you see in front of you came from one man, and he's right here. It is my father, Peter Griffith, and I would like him to stand because he deserves an applause. <laughs> Finally, I would like to tell you this, I have two children. Their names are Taryn and Austin Edgar. They are the reason I'm in front of you, because I know I have work to do to make this world a better place for them. But it's because of their father, who I love so much. So much that I can stand in front, literally stand in front of you right now, because he loves me. He loves me. And I, this is weird, right? Because you don't have people get up on stage and say this, but I'm telling you right now. Tosh, please stand up. Because he loves me, y'all. So, if you don't see me at the after party, I left with George Coons. Uh, oh, no, wait. Hold on. Sorry. I left. Um, sorry, that was wrong. Wait, I read my lines wrong. Um, uh, I'll be dancing shortly. Anyway, um, I want to just say to you, thank you so much for coming here tonight. I want to thank all of our sponsors. I want to thank all of you for coming. And I want to say to DJ D-Nice, I'm ready to party. Let's party, y'all. Thank you.